You're welcome to uh, this afternoon's webinar. My name is Sally Reynolds, and this webinar is organized by the EMMA project. EMMA is providing multilingual access to European MOOCs. And this afternoon, as you probably already know, we're going to be talking about video. The title of the session this afternoon is Capturing and Delivering Effective Video as Part of Your MOOC. And we'll have two speakers, two people very experienced in the topic, uh, Deborah Arnold from the University of Burgundy in France and Mathieu Van Buell from ATIT here in Belgium. This webinar is going to take about an hour, and during that time, you're very welcome to ask questions using the chat box at the bottom, and I'll make sure that any questions or any comments you make uh, will be put to our two speakers as well. They're each going to talk for about 15 minutes, and then after that, we'll have a chance for some conversation and for some questions and input from you. So you can always start by telling us in the chat box where you're watching from today and whereabouts you're based, so we know where everybody's coming from. So just before we get started, just to remind you that uh, these are some screenshots from the uh, EMMA portal, which you're very welcome to go to. We have a whole bunch of new MOOCs which have just been launched recently, lots of social media channels that you can use to communicate with, lots of places that you can join up for a MOOC. So we hope that you'll be able to join us and take part in one of the EMMA MOOCs over the next couple of months. So starting uh, this afternoon, we're going to, the first speaker this afternoon is going to be Deborah. So Deborah Arnold from the University of Burgundy, which has also, not only as a partner in the EMMA project, but who have also been delivering MOOCs in the EMMA platform as well too. So I'm going to switch off my mic and camera for now and hand over to you, Deborah. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Sally, and uh, hello to everybody. There's a few names that I recognize in the participants. Um, just to follow on from what uh, Sally said, that uh, if you want to follow a MOOC on EMMA, um, then obviously have a look at the platform. But if you want to publish a MOOC on EMMA, that's also a possibility. EMMA is now open to, uh, uh, to MOOC providers outside the platform. And some of the things we're going to be looking at um, this afternoon uh, will no doubt be of, of help for you in designing uh, your MOOCs and in particular in designing the, the video aspect of MOOCs. Um, there's a lot of debate that's been going on around um, video in MOOCs. Is it essential? Um, is it a nice to have? What kind of production values are we looking for? Um, and so I'd like in the next uh, 15 minutes or so to talk you through um, uh, some of the, uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly videos that I've found um, uh, through studying a series of MOOCs on different platforms. Um, and uh, try and get some discussion going on what we think um, is, uh, is appropriate, of course, according to the subject matter being, um, uh, being studied. So um, one of the people who's written quite a lot about uh, uh, video for teaching and learning is um, Donald Clark. Uh, some of you may know or have read his work on his Plan B blog. Um, one of the first things that I found from Donald was um, running through a series of YouTube genres for teaching and learning. Now, these aren't necessarily connected to MOOCs, but I think they give us some good indications um, of uh, some effective uh, and perhaps less common uses of, of video. Um, if you look at the Khan Academy, for example, um, just using blackboard and colored chalk, it's simple, it's effective. Um, and uh, it really takes us away from the, the talking heads that, uh, that we see, that you see here as well. Here I'm being a talking head, but uh, um, we're in a more rich media environment with the slides and with the discussion for interaction um, and the live webinar. Um, also, hand and whiteboard. Um, we don't care about what the person uh, looks like, the head, when they're speaking. It's the working through the problems and the solutions. And I think for scientific subjects, when you have to run through mathematical equations and so on, again, um, seeing and hearing the, um, the way that these equations are developed and the logic behind them, working through them, as a traditional teacher would do on a blackboard or a whiteboard, um, again, that's useful. Um, RSA animations, you may have seen these, which um, are drawings that become um, uh, single infographics at the end, and the camera pans across from one side to the next, and the, d the, d the drawing develops. Uh, it's very dynamic um, and uh, very useful to accompany a storytelling approach. Um, 
We also have seen uh, TED Talks, and we know the success that TED Talks have. Um, here we have um, a very short, dynamic format. It's a, it's a little bit like little bit like the rock star professor that we hear about. Um, but I, I think there we should be careful that the form um, does not take over the actual content. Um, and uh, so to be used, I think, uh, uh, when it's considered useful. We need to discover when that, when that is. Um, Donald Clark also mentioned software demos. These would be like screencasts um, running through the steps. These are quite popular, obviously, when uh, you have step-by-step -step processes. Um, physical demonstrations, um, and I like this comment of, uh, from the user side of Donald Clark when he said, I take my tablet to the place where I need it, so you're actually next to the piece of machinery that you need to know how it functions, and you have the video demonstration next to you. Um, and obviously, um, the, uh, the use of video for sports coaching, uh, looking at sporting gestures, and uh, a bit of a plug for the next University of Burgundy MOOC coming out, which is going to be um, about the art and science of movement, working with our sports team here. Um, so those were some of the, uh, uh, the video genres, I think, that we could use as a starting point. Um, Donald Clark also looked at um, the use of video in um, a MOOC on uh, human-computer interaction. Um, and these were some of the criticisms that uh, he gave. Um, it was, um, the video was uh, in a small screen, I suppose like in this environment, uh, there was a lot of talking heads. Um, the text and video at the same time, um, Donald Clark thinks that this brings cognitive dissonance. Um, and so this is my comment, is does this mean the death of rich media and environments like this? Um, uh, it depends, of course, if the, um, if the text actually uh, is compatible and coherent with, the, uh, with what's being said, and if the, the discourse of the, um, the person presenting uh, is in line with the text, or is there really too much information to take in? Um, that's a uh, big debate on that um, and a lot of research as well. Um, this was quite surprising to find in a MOOC on human computer interfaces um, that uh, the presenters were describing um, diagrams, techniques and procedures, but the images weren't there to support them. Um, uh, the presentation style is important for maintaining attention, and I hope you will feel, bear with us for the next hour and that Matty and I do have sufficiently engaging presentation styles um, uh, to keep your interest. Um, and a comment from the technical side that poor editing, um, uh, Donald Clark felt, had a negative effect, effect on retention, that uh, if uh, there's poor quality, uh, then the attention of, of viewers, people following the MOOC and the videos, uh, is drawn towards criticizing the quality. And, and so less focus on the actual content. Um, there are other arguments which say that the quality of the video doesn't really matter and it is the content that's important. So I think a lot of these points are open for uh, debate. Um, there was some research done on um, edX uh, on how MOOC video production uh, affects student engagement. Um, the, this team studied uh, four different kinds of video from the edX platform, uh, recorded classroom lecture, instructors talking head, um, the Khan style digital tablet drawing, um, and a PowerPoint slideshow. Uh, so from all the different video genres that we've seen, this is still uh, quite a limited uh, selection. Um, but there was a research article published on this that I invite you to um, have a look at. Uh, Alberto, our colleague, has just published the, the link for you there in the chat. Um, some of the conclusions from this, uh, this uh, article, um, and uh, for those of us who've been in video production for many, many years, from television broadcasting now through to uh, uh, MOOCs uh, and so forth, um, none of this is really very new. But anyway, this is what um, uh, the, the edX researchers found, that shorter videos are more, engagement, uh, more engaging. Um, the uh, rule of uh, uh, keeping the video short, um, six minutes maximum. Um, I've been discussing this with academics here in my university, uh, and especially in the science field. And their comment was, yes, but if we want to talk through a mathematical equation, we can't do that in six minutes if we want to talk the students through 
through all the different steps that are needed in the mental processes um, of constructing that um, um, uh, mathematical formula. Uh, so, um, okay, take this as a benchmark, but really decide on what is appropriate for the content and the message and the learning activity uh, and the learning objectives that you have. Um, videos that intersperse an instructor's talking head with PowerPoint slides are more engaging. It almost seems as if these people, this is going to go on record, but it seems as if these people are just discovering video and pedagogical um, video for the first time. Um, we'll leave that one aside. Um, a personal feel to videos um, rather than high fidelity studio recordings. Are the two incompatible? I ask you that question. Um, the tablet Drawing tutorials are more engaging than PowerPoint slides. I think we could, uh, I would agree there uh, in that they're more dynamic and you've got this progression uh, that can follow the, the discourse. Um, high quality recorded cl classroom lectures, not as engaging when chopped up into so short segments for a MOOC. Um, lecture capture is often used as um, a uh, perhaps a low, low cost, although the initial um, investment is important and high, um, but for uh, recycling uh, materials for MOOCs and when they're chopped up. But I think, again, uh, we have to look at the learning activities that are embedded, embedded into the MOOC and not just focus on the content. Um, videos where instructors speak fairly fast and with high enthusiasm are more engaging. Um, I'm not sure that the speaking fairly fast, this was a discussion that came up um, in a in a face-to-face uh, -face workshop that we ran on this subject um, and um, some people said that uh, native speaker instructors speaking fairly fast excludes um, uh, a high percentage of non-native speakers who need uh, somebody speaking more slowly and clearly as I'm trying to do here um, and a different engagement with lecture and tutorial videos anyway so those were the conclusions made I think there is scope for much more research on this subject um, as we see more and more videos and there are people out there as well who say that who defend the fact that they're doing MOOCs without a single video um, and I think perhaps in more connectivist or social MOOCs uh, this is um, uh, an argument that can also be, be, be valid because the focus is on the learning activities but here we're, to, we're here today to talk about video um, and, uh, uh, and, and what kinds of uh, videos are uh, effective for learning, uh, teaching and learning in MOOCs. So um, I would just like to run you through a few examples that I picked up from three different platforms. Um, the Emma platform, of course, uh, because this webinar is, is run within the Emma project. And as Sally said earlier, um, my university, University of Burgundy, is fully involved in this project. Um, another European platform, which is run by the ECHO project, which I suppose we could call the sister project uh, to Emma. Um, um, and so we'll have a look at some examples from there. And then from the national French um, MOOC platform, FUN, uh, France Université Numérique, FUN MOOC, uh, because there's some nice examples from there as well. Um, so starting with FUN, so here you have the link to, um, to FUN. Um, uh, lots and lots of MOOCs now on a variety of subjects from French higher education institutions. Um, uh, so I don't need to go through the whole subjects there. But, um, uh, and this is Emma, the European Multiple MOOC Aggregator. I think you've had the link to that. And also the link to ECHO. Now the Hub 5 ECHO Learning is the French hub because ECHO takes, uh, has partners running on a variety of platforms. So one of the things that we have here in France is somebody called uh, Remy Sharak who's done um, a nice series of video tutorials which are available uh, in French unfortunately or fortunately for the French audience on creating a MOOC from A to Z. Um, we're coming up with the subtitles in a moment um, um, because they are fully integrated into the Emma platform. So anyway, so we have this series of uh, 19 um, tutorials on creating pedagogical videos. Um, this is a very do-it-yourself approach. Um, this is Remy's office, which is transformed into a studio with um, a green curtain for, uh, for green screen recording, uh, chroma key recording. Um, and 
And a few examples, um, for example, filming writing with a camera placed above, um, which uh, replaces this uh, idea of writing on a blackboard or a whiteboard, a chalkboard. Um, we've talked about that. This was a nice use of um, uh, split screen, where the, um, uh, the experiment is being shown physically, and the explanation um, is being written at the same time. I look quite quite like that um, as a, an original and effective solution. Um, filming writing on a whiteboard, there you obviously have to be careful about the space taken up by the, the teacher seen from behind, but then that's what many students see in the lecture theatre and the classroom as well. But maybe once that's fixed on video, um, it becomes less effective. Um, we also have um, something that looks very much like this environment here in, uh, in the webinar. Um, once it's recorded, um, used as rich media with a PowerPoint synchronized to um, uh, the, the video. Now, I'd like you to have, uh, take a, a close look at this, analyze the different elements that you, you can see on the screen. Um, and then I'm going to show you the third iteration version of this project management MOOC, which is one of the most popular in France, um, and spot the difference. So if people want to put what they see as the difference in the chat, that might be interesting. So I'll flip between the two. Anybody in the chat wants to see what they see as, say as the difference? Does the second, the third version look better than the first? Well, in fact, um, there were so many comments on, yeah, the headset is gone. Thanks, Suesha. Um, there were so many comments on social media. This guy actually became a kind of meme on social media. There were drawings of him with his headset, and I've got a headset on here. Um, and uh, people actually asked him what he looks like without the headset. And so for the third iteration, he redid all his films without the headset. Um, I don't really think that that makes a, a significant um, uh, difference, but uh, uh, it was interesting to see how people latch on to certain visual details over and above the content itself of the MOOC. Um, now we have a nice example from our colleagues at the University of Naples, um, filming people in situ um, in um, a nice old building, which I think is part of the campus there. And uh, this is also to illustrate the full integration of uh, subtitles in other languages, uh, which is one of the specificities of the um, um, uh, of the Emma platform. Uh, so we have a system for generating the uh, the transcriptions and then translating them and embedding the um, uh, the subtitles into the video. Okay, um, and then we have an example uh, from um, a MOOC of which I was co-author myself, um, where we decided um, not to use video at all, apart from uh, a recording of a hangout for the initial presentation, and the rest we used a very simple uh, stop-motion animation uh, to get our point across. And that was a conscious decision uh, to take a different approach to, uh, to um, uh, video uh, in, in MOOCs. Um, this is a format that I particularly like, uh, which is uh, the informal chat, where um, it's more of an, an interview, a conversation between two experts or between um, an interviewer and an expert. Um, there has been debate on this, um, whereby where you have two people talking to each other, um, but not talking to camera, um, that the audience might feel excluded and just be an observer to a conversation. So I think, again, that's something to explore in terms of impact um, on, uh, on learning. And uh, to finish on, I think this is my last example, or one of my last examples. Um, this is the most popular MOOC in France, from manager to leader. Uh, there's just been um, a, a, a new iteration from manager to agile leader. Um, it has 
now 100,000 uh, people who followed it. Many people go through uh, right to the end. And um, although the format here is not that um, uh, original, um, it's uh, with the green screen and um, diagrams projected in the background. One of the um, uh, points for success of this uh, was the charisma of the presenter um, who became very, very popular. So again, we go back to this idea of do you need a rock star professor uh, to make a MOOC successful. Um, some people have even gone as far as suggesting that teachers should be replaced by actors because those are the most competent people to be presenting in a televisual style. Um, again, I think that one is open for debate. So those are um, a few uh, of the uh, examples that uh, I've pulled up. Um, if anybody has any, any questions, I think uh, that uh, uh, now's the time for you to ask those questions. Tell me which of the formats you prefer, which you've experimented with yourselves, um, any that, uh, uh, that we've missed here, and that it would be useful to explore. So thank you very much. It's a bit of a problem with my um, uh, slide there. <laughs> it's a bit all over the place. Um, but there you have my contact details, my Twitter handle, and uh, obviously feel free to get in touch with the AMA project. So thank you very much. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you, Deborah. I hope you can, you can hear me all OK. Um, please do put questions, points of view for Deborah into the chat. Uh, we have some discussion going on, as you can see, about the, um, I wasn't quite sure what Case was talking about in terms of the subtitles um, and flipping classrooms. So maybe if you have a specific question for Deborah, you could put that to her now into the chat box, please, Case. Uh, and also our colleagues from, from Portugal were also commenting as well. Um, Deborah, I, you've raised lots of questions there, um, the rock star versus the not rock star. Uh, how easy is it for you in, 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 in Burgundy, for example, to get some of your academics to, to stand in front of a camera, to be charismatic? Do you do any formal training with them? Um, we don't do formal training as such, although that's something I really would like to bring in um, uh, to associate it with our communication department's media, tr media training um, uh, program. Um, we find that by um, accompanying the, uh, the academics from day one when we're um, uh, designing the MOOC, um, providing them with different options. Some are more comfortable with a um, prompter. Others prefer to, uh, to be more spontaneous. Lots and lots of preparation, um, practice sessions, uh, getting in front of the camera, but not on the day that you have to film everything. Um, and uh, showing them lots of examples as well as, as, uh, as well of what's, what's been produced elsewhere. Um, uh, we have found that most of them do a pretty good job in the end. Uh, they might be a little bit reticent um, at the beginning, a little hesitant, um, uh, but uh, um, in the end, they, they uh, do find that they enjoy it. Yeah. Um, and as well, yes, indeed, I understand why you need to use uh, subtitles. Um, just That is just to mention that with Emma is that, of course, the idea behind Emma is to provide multilingual MOOCs. So as far as possible, most of the MOOCs now available on Emma are available at least in two languages. And we use a lot of subtitling and a lot of uh, transcripting as well. And in fact, the experience last year of the, the MOOCs from Burgundy, we did have them in both languages, didn't we, Deborah? It's still at the early stages, a lot of this, but it does have a lot of potential, I think it's fair to say. Mm -hmm. And we've even gone as far as having some MOOCs in three languages on Emma as well, haven't we? Yeah. Yep. Yep. So, uh, if you, okay, if you'd like to hold your questions or any other points you'd like to raise uh, based on what um, Deborah's been speaking about, we're going to switch speaker now. So, Deborah will get you to switch off yours and uh, get Matty to put on his camera and to bring up his slides and hand over to you, Matty. Thank you. Uh, Matty, we have no sound from your end. 
In the meantime, has anybody got any... Uh, Lisa, you've asked the same question. Indeed, are the slides of everyone available later? Yes, we, we always make the slides available afterwards along with the recording of the session. So uh, if you check onto the EMMA website, and we'll give you the link at the end of the session as well, uh, where you can check on not just this, um, this webinar, but in fact, this is one in a series of webinars that we've been running about putting uh, your MOOC onto EMMA. So we started in November, and so you will already find recordings of webinars on design. Uh, so for that, um, well, who am I to talk about technical things when I get my own microphone not to work? Very sorry for that. So um, anyway, um, I was going to talk. Uh, the, the, thank you, Deborah, for uh, great examples. Um, I recognize some of the examples and, and some of the, the issues and questions that, that you raised from uh, our, our practice, we had a kind of similar uh, practice in a long time, working indeed for, for 20 years in, in developing media for education. Uh, but media for education goes, in fact, goes back a much longer way. Um, as soon as, as film and, and later than video got uh, invented or, or developed, uh, immediately educators were amongst the first people to, to, to claim that this was going to be their instrument of the future. Um, um, about 100 years ago, Thomas Edison, for example, he declared the textbooks for debt and he said that it was going to be the end of, of the teachers because uh, all the textbooks and teachers were going to be replaced by, by film in those days. That was 1920. Uh, and then when television came, uh, same thing happened. Television was going to be the window on the world. It was going to be the, the interactive or the, the, the visual blackboard, the, the window on, on everything that you could learn. So uh, at that moment, people said, well, teachers will have no future. Uh, people will learn just by watching television. Um, if that was the case, I think what we would be doing is like what the babysitter does. It's putting the baby in front of the TV set with the remote control. And that, is that what we can do with our students? Can we just send them a video and say, here, look at this. It's self-paced, self-regulated, it's independent learning, and that's it. I don't think it all works like that. Um, I think that, that media, whatever the media is, is just a vehicle. I agree with, with Clark in this sense uh, about the uh, Ruth Clark. This is not Donald Clark. Um, this is somebody who was long before Donald Clark with, with, with study of the use of media in education. And I think some of, of her conclusions um, that she did together with, with Richard Mayer were, were quite interesting. Um, because they, they came to the conclusion that it's not so much uh, the choice of the media, but it's much more the choice of the media mix. So the, the video will never be just standing by itself and will not be just a learning vehicle just by itself. It is it's just one of the uh, experiences that the, the learner should go to. So that is, uh, in fact, a little bit what, what, we, uh, what we learned as well. Uh, you are... Uh, experience with, with video. In this presentation I, I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the provider because in the end it is the provider who chooses when or whether they are going to use videos in, in the, the learning offer. Um, so from this perspective, first of all Emma, uh, Deborah has introduced already what, what we can do on Emma. Secondly, I wanted to, to briefly present you my ideas of what kind of videos can be used on a MOOC. And when they can be used for learning, and then how they should maximize in some way the student learning outcomes, especially but not exclusively with MOOCs, and then very briefly about prejudices about the use of, of video, and then I would like to briefly also talk about the interface from the learner, because we it is an, an, an offer-driven uh, media video, it, it's not the learner who decides I'm going to choose that MOOC because it has video, uh, that is not the case yet. The learners do often choose for a video to learn something. For example, when you uh, when you're learning to to uh, to do a certain software, you may go to to YouTube and 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 look how does that trick work in gaming, for example. Lots of people choose that way of learning rather than going to a book. But in MOOCs, in learning in learning and teaching situation like MOOCs, it is the provider who decides what uh, medium that he's going to uh, offer. Okay, so putting videos on Emma, um, it is in fact a very, very 
simple uh, thing. It is part, it's completely integrated in the platform. Uh, you can put your videos when they are produced, you can put them on YouTube or Vimeo, and then you can embed them or publish them through the Emma platform, and as uh, Deborah said, also uh, uh, provide subtitling to the videos. Also interesting is that you can ask uh, learners to, to set to, to uh, upload their own videos, for example for assignments, and they can upload their own videos, but only on YouTube, on their own personal blog uh, pages. Uh, one of the, the strong points of Emma is, in, is the, the personal learning environment, and there, in fact, learners are able to uh, work with their own videos. So what kind of videos can be used in, in MOOC? Um, just very quickly going over the examples that, uh, that Deborah also gave you. You have the lecture style, indeed. Um, you have then uh, the tutorial videos, which is the calm type video, of, or the, the software videos, or, or the, the hands-on, how to, to work with the machinery, the just in time and just in place videos. Like you run this video on this place next to the machine, as Donald Clark uh, gave an example, something that in fact is already happening in, in, uh, in for example, in Fiat, the, the tractor factor, uh, factories of Fiat, for quite some time. Um, to show expert interviews, which is sometimes it is the teacher themselves who consider themselves as being the, the provider of the expertise, but also very interesting is to give kind of like guest lectures to experts to, to bring into a MOOC. Panel discussions is an interesting uh, way of, of working. Uh, for example, the discussion video that uh, Deborah showed but also uh, pre-recorded things like documentaries, reportages, stuff that you can also find online, archives, Arabiana. Uh, very often we, we think too, too, uh, too narrow with regard to the use of video, too much, with regard, uh, too much thinking about the videos that we should produce ourselves, but there's a lot of video that can be used also in a different way, and that's something that I will uh, talk about a little later on. So when to use video, very often it is used, and that is, that's kind of the traditional way of using video in, in MOOCs, as the content container. Uh, it's an easy translation from the lecture into uh, a distance learning, if you like to. It's just doing your lecture in front of a camera with some slides, and then you can edit the slides, or you can uh, present them side by side or so, uh, two different ways, editing the video inside the slides, or having to, uh, to screens, one with the lecture and one with the, the slides, so that people can choose where they, uh, um, where they focus their attention. Um, but it's very often the carrier of the information. You, the lecturer very often has his presentations or his content prepared in a presentation type of manner, and then it's in fact easy and cheap to, to convert it into video for a movie. So, that's the first, the most traditional, the most used way of uh, video in, in MOOCs, but you can do much more. Um, you can, for example, in the middle of, of your MOOC where you're showing formulas or, or uh, uh, theoretical demonstrations, you can, for example, show videos at that moment or links to videos that not necessarily have to be embedded with demonstrations of experiments or illustration of ideas with with, for example, slow motion animation, the example of so that, that Deborah gave for her last MOOC, for a virtual field visit, for example, if you refer to the Acropolis in, in, your, uh, in your MOOC, it may be interesting to, to have there a walkthrough on video to the Acropolis to, to illustrate some of the things that you're saying, not necessarily to be the content container, but to, to do other things with uh, the content. So uh, to, to give kind of a context or, or uh, a wider interest in uh, the use of video. Um, demonstrate techniques or mechanical skills or assessment. And then I want to come back to, to uh, the use of, for example, learner-generated videos that you can add to your personal learning environment for an assessment task, for example. A um, typical example of demonstration of techniques is in surgery, uh, where operation techniques are, are demonstrated and where you can, for example, then analyze for yourself how fast or how slow that you want to see these images. And we want to go back to, to really study them in, in depth. Um, 
when to use video, this is a little bit of a, of a, 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 a topography of, of different ways of using video, because we, we sometimes think a little bit too narrow. Um, this is based on, on the models of Jack Kumi, uh, the pedagogical uh, use models of Jack Kumi for more for scenario building. It was not really uh, uh, intended for, for uh, use of books, but I think this can be used also uh, to, to have a little bit more creative use of video in education. When can you use video? For example, at the beginning of uh, a, a lesson to kind of set the scene, to, to engage, to stimulate, to motivate the learner, to, to be interested in the scene. Or maybe, for example, to recap what has been done in the previous lesson. A typical example for that is, is language lessons, where uh, you can start with, for example, a video of examples of, of the use of language that is recapped from the last lesson so that everybody knows, okay, that's where we are, a very typical pedagogical um, activity. And another example is activation of the learners. Uh, it can be something, for example, that, that you uh, demonstrate in, in, in front of the camera and that you ask the pupils to do for themselves. Uh, the, the, uh, the elaboration of algebraic formulas, uh, uh, software that is demonstrated that the, 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 the learner can uh, do afterwards and so on. Another example is affection, to create affection with the subject. A um, typical example, if you like to, is uh, where, uh, in, for example, let's say the, um, an, an, an example about uh, climate change, one of the MOOCs that, that were in EMMA, where it started with, an, uh, with a video about the dramatic consequences of uh, climate change. It all, if, if you like to, theoretically, the, the subject is, is, is it's already quite interesting and challenging, but if you can show like what the real uh, effect and impact is of uh, climate change, then you get a deeper connection with the learners. Uh, enabled cognition uh, is another activity, uh, for example, prediction or interpretation. Do or ask the students to interpret uh, uh, a certain video. And one such example that I like a lot is is from uh, Veritasium. Uh, it's, it's, that's a, a website with videos by uh, Muller in Australia. He has collected a lot of self-made videos about misconceptions in science and other education, mathematics and science education. And he, uh, he splits up the videos then sometimes into videos when, where he first challenges the learner to think ahead or to predict what the outcome is. And then he posts the second part of the video in the second uh, part of the lesson and he shows them how right or how wrong they are and he tries to explain then how come they have built up such a misconception. It's a, it's a very useful uh, exercise to, in which video can help a lot. And then definitely the, the, the last way, or not, not the last because this is not an exclusive list, but uh, and also very nice uh, use of video is of course to visualize, as I said, for example, uh, slow motion of, of impact of a tennis ball on a racket or uh, visualize also the inside of a nuclear reactor. It's not some, some place where you can bring your, your students or where you can uh, reach the, the kind of uh, effect, the learning effect by just describing it theoretically and with, with drawings, but for example with animations and with a virtual visit, it's, it's much more are interesting. So there are just examples and I, I would uh, challenge everybody uh, to, to think wider than just, oh, video is just a talking head. It is more, you can do much more. We, we sometimes are thinking a little bit too narrow with uh, our uh, application of video. Um, then the, the second question is about uh, maximizing student learning outcomes with video. Um, we, we, we don't know, the, there is not a big body of evidence about the impact and this is something that everybody wants to know, the, the return on learning impact is, is very difficult. Uh, more and more we are seeing that, that in, in uh, learner analytics we are looking at video as well, how much of a video has a learner seen, etc. But we know from some of the studies that, that have been done in the Netherlands and Finland, for example, that um, just learning views does not mean uh, learning impact. Um, what, what is noticed is um, 
that, for example, uh, by the time of exams, that, that you see a high peak, not, not only in the Netherlands, but also in Singapore, for example, is a very interesting uh, uh, research done by David Tan on the impact of, of or rather on the use of, of video by students. And um, the, the, the big uh, conclusion that they have is that by the time of of exams or assignments, you see that students go back to look at videos uh, to refresh their uh, their knowledge, rather than throughout the year to, to work on the building up of their knowledge. So uh, Deborah already mentioned a couple of these things in, in Donald Clark's uh, blog, um, which which comes from a an, an, an limited study, in fact, on on uh, on edX, uh, which indeed. Um, confirms some of the, the lessons that, that have been built up over the last 20-30 years of the use of video in, in education. Um, short videos have a, a larger impact than uh, long videos, it's true, but as Deborah says, you need time to develop ideas. So uh, slow learning is now also becoming kind of a, a new buzzword, um, rather than uh, asking for uh, rather than giving the students like the summary of, of the, the, the literature that they have to read where they get like a, a reader's digest with the, the, the 10 most important pages uh, now uh, it, it's coming back that that learners are encouraged to to read the full books over a longer time that they take more time also to get into uh, the reading the same way with videos that it's not just like uh, you, you can just cut the, the the three most important minutes of a speech of somebody, but it may be interesting to go through the slow process of the, the thought development, etc. So while there is indeed uh, evidence that, that learners or viewers very often cut off uh, before the 30 second mark, um, you, you can be sure that 85% of viewers have seen 30 seconds, but after that there's a quick drop off between 2 and 10 minutes. So by 10 minutes, only 50% at best is still watching a video. What does that mean? It means indeed that the most important part should be at, at the top so that at least the learner knows this is for me, this is something that, that fits into my, uh, my learning program. So that is the most important lesson. But I don't think that it's, the lesson should be for the producer that all the videos have to be cut to less than two minutes. That is, that is I think, a mistake. I think, as Deborah says, the, the video should be as long as the video is relevant. And maybe it's much more important to, to have the video, uh, a long video, cut up in, in chapters rather than saying, like, we're going to condense it into very short bits. Um, again, this is uh, confirming what, what Deborah says. What I want to add to that is the, the importance of production, pre-production and post-production. That's a little bit underestimated sometimes. It requires good classroom recordings or good lecture recordings always require planning in order to be engaging. So preparation, rehearsal is, is worthwhile to keep uh, the learners engaged. Personal feel. Um, that but this is not exclusive to, to video, this is um, general to learning in, in general. Um, eye contact, good audio uh, is, is very important. Um, I can't remember who said it, but uh, it's a very famous uh, statement that video is uh, radio with images. I think that's, that's true. The most important uh, part of, uh, of video is audio, that, because that is the largest container of the content. This does not mean that the, the video is not important, but still, uh, audio very often is, has to be the best quality and is most of the time underestimated. It's, it's not something that is really tangible and visible and it requires a little bit of more understanding and, and preparation, for example, finding a quiet place to do the recording, etc., understanding how microphones work. Well, a video is, you see what, what you get is what you see, or what you see is what you get, so uh, that, that sounds, it sounds more simple to do. And therefore, audio is sometimes put on the second plan while it is more important. Um, the, the importance of, of images and audio uh, in, in the open cast lecture, envi lecture capture environment, there, there are quite some strong voices that say that there is no great advantage of having video, but it's sufficient to have audio and slides, and the, the video of the, the speaker does not really matter that much. 
Um, that is a little bit controversial. Um, not everybody. Uh, then there is no evidence that that uh, it, one is better than the other. I think that is something that has to be uh, assessed case by case. Um, the ambiguous effect of production value, um, for me, uh, uh, that means like uh, you, it is not necessary to, to have like beautiful sets. Or in the past, I remember we were talking about uh, being made up when you went on camera or dressing correctly. You couldn't wear pinstripe shirts because of the interference with cameras, etc. That has nothing to do with production value. I think production value is is having professional people watching the quality of what you're doing, not only professional uh, pedagogical people who, who can coach you or, or prepare you, train you, but also technical people who can help you setting up your camera, helping setting you up your audio environment and so on, helping you also with your editing to avoid editing effects or, or uh, other uh, things that are to be avoided. Um, student learning, candid drawing is more engaging in PowerPoint. Um, again, these are things that, that have been said. Uh, this is again the discussion about do you have to be a good presenter or do you have to be a good expert. I think combination of both is, is the most important and I believe also that, that good educators are most of the time also good actors so they, they know how to keep, for example, good eye contact. Uh, Engage, uh, also contextualize that content with with, with uh, personal experiences, uh, give examples and and so on. Um, that's something that has to be used also in in video. Um, this come back to to the same uh, subject, and then uh, to to finish these these uh, cases of good pedagogical uh, use, some prejudices. Uh, First of all, about uh, our students watching the videos. Um, this is um, uh, this this is this is becoming more and more an issue under learning analytics. So people want to to know whether students are watching the videos, but there is no way uh, whether you can really know whether your student has just started the video, got mean to, meanwhile distracted, and was just reading something else or doing WhatsApp or, or, or Twittering while the video was running. So just te technically speaking, there is no such solution yet to know whether your students have been watching video unless you build in, for example, uh, questions in the video that have to be solved in another way. So do uh, students watch the videos, yes or no? Um, it is, it's not clear. Until we have better analytical instruments, we don't know. Now, I think for the provider side, we have to, to be aware of the fact that learners still have a preference for text materials. Although that we believe and we think it's nice to have video, learners still have a preference for text materials where it is possible. Not when something has to be explained with video, but otherwise it does not make sense to, to be just reading slides in front of the learners. In that case, the video is boring and the pupils, the, the, student, the students will not watch the video at all. Um, if the, the video is not well made, bad badly editing, bad camera work, uh, bad audio, etc., students will not look, and in fact, it may work detrimental to the learning at all. So, if it's all that complicated, then is it worth all the trouble? Is the big uh, question. And video is a little bit of trouble. It is not as simple as just sitting in front of a webcam and, and just uh, talking to a webcam, that, that it's more than that. It requires preparation, it re requires a little bit of talent and attention to uh, the technical and pedagogical details, and it also requires a little bit of uh, post-production processing afterwards in order to, to deliver a properly working instrument of learning to the pupils. So it requires special uh, Skills. It, it's not. Uh, it's not very complicated. But just saying, like uh, I, I, I have all the software on my computer. I can do it. Is not uh, really the case. There is a little bit of experience, or at least a little bit of training or learning uh, how to do it involved. And then another project. This is the the expensive. Uh, the, the cost of video. Uh, video. If 
not necessarily more expensive than uh, creating uh, written materials because the, the main work of uh, the video is in the, the creation of the scenario. The additional work is there is a cost to it, but it is not uh, an, a cost that cannot be overcome. Hardware and software are very cheap, very reusable, they, they have a long uh, lifespan. So there, that is not where the cost is. The cost is mainly in human resources. Like the people that will help you, to train you, the, the, the preparation, etc. That, um, uh, that go into the preparation and the, the working of the video. So video is not expensive, but it's much more the human resources that go into it. And that is comparable to the human resources that go into good quality creation of textbooks or in other uh, humanly supported learning activities. To come to uh, the, the player interface, the user interface um, on the user side, um, we did a little bit of an investigation in a in, 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 uh, uh, population of, of adult learners in, in the medical sector on what they want to do, uh, to see in, in uh, the navigation of uh, a video, uh, uh, video playback. And the, the logical things come back there, play, pause, stop, volume control, things that you see in, in YouTube as well. But also, and that is that's something interesting, to increase the speed uh, to, for example, 1.2 or 1.5, possibly with uh, the pitch of the audio respected to the original pitch, in order to be able to listen quicker, to go quicker to, uh, to a video. Um, video is not like reading. Uh, People that can read very fast have a book read in, in less time than slow readers. In video, you, the speed is defined by the person who has created the video, but by giving the option to increase or decrease the speed, you get uh, the possibility to go through it quicker. Um, people want to, to see the display of where they are in the video, the progress bar and the total time of the video, so that they know if there's much more and, and what the total bulk of the video is. They want to be able to navigate by the keyboard, for example, start and stop with with, um, with the, the space bar. Uh, they want captions, subtitles or captions in the uh, in the captions in the original language and subtitles then in a translated language. Also, to be able, for example, to to uh, view the video without um, the sound uh, on the loudspeakers. Uh, this is an interface of of one particular uh, video uh, repository with, for example, the slides, the speaker and the slides in big, where the, 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 the student can choose, in fact, where to go to in the slides. Um, what uh, students all, uh, or adult learners in this case, also wanted to do is download, be able to download or view the video offline or watch it on other channels, just not necessarily inside the, the, the MOOC or the, the learning platform. The full screen mode and adjusting the video quality is, is uh, of interest. And then interaction with the video, for example, in video quizzing. This is something that is uh, not necessarily uh, on behalf of the learner, but it's interesting for the, the, the provider to see how that learners interact with the video. Um, learners sometimes want to be able to extract parts of it, to, to store it, for example, to say, like, that's a, a piece that I want to see later, or they want to be able to annotate, tag, uh, also assess uh, quizzes, and, for example, see the statistics, or see who has seen a lot, or what, what colleagues of them have seen something. And a very important thing is the possibility to, to search in uh, a video. Um, get uh, the captions are a very important uh, role in that. For example, if you are able to, to extract the, the text from the speech, you are able to put the captions in the, the, the video repository as well, and it, it helps you then to search, in fact, in the video, like you would be able to search in uh, in the text. Um, this is my last slide, don't, don't worry. So, searching inside transcripts, is, is in, in, inside presentations, and then what the, the learners also want is to, to have the additional access to uh, to documentation or uh, information that goes with uh, the uh, the video. I'm going to stop there. I'm sorry for the little bit of a hiccup at the start and for taking quite a bit of time. And I hope that there are still questions that we can answer. Thank you.
Thanks, Matty. Uh, we'll ask Deborah as well to come back and join us. And please, if you have any questions or points of view you'd like to put to Deborah or to Matty, maybe you're creating your own video at this stage. We have people from lots of different European countries. If you're creating video yourselves and if you have any practical questions you'd like to put, or indeed any tips you'd like to share, anything that you found particularly helpful, um, please do include them into the, um, into the chat box at the bottom. We'd be delighted to hear from you. Um, I see there were a couple of comments uh, during Matty, the point about good communication being the key. Um, indeed, none of this is particularly new, Deborah or Matty, is it? This is, as you said yourself, Deborah, this is kind of, this is stuff we know somehow. There's nothing particularly new to it in terms of a MOOC, or is there? Deborah. Um, I think one of the things with uh, with MOOCs is um, is just the, the sheer size of the audience um, and the fact that uh, many of these videos are um, uh, seen as being very very public and I think that um, is uh, one of the shifts between um, perhaps the more confidential um, online learning uh, traditional distance learning um, even though in distance learning video I think has been uh, grossly underused um, uh, many distance learning organizations have taken some time to move from the print based um, uh, sending the textbook to people's homes um, rather than getting um, um, uh, you know, more, more, more visual uh, ways of, of getting the message across. Um, and I think also one of the, um, uh, one of the newer ideas is something that um, uh, Matty picked up on, and that is um, learn it, produce videos as learning assignments. And I think there's enormous scope there um, for designing activities, learning activities, which necessitate the production of a video um, by the learners. And there the assessment criteria obviously won't be on the, um, uh, the production values or the audiovisual qualities per se, but more in the, um, uh, uh, in the proof of learning uh, and applied learning that the students are getting across. But maybe there does need to be a minimum respect of some of the, uh, the basic uh, uh, media production um, techniques that Matty men mentioned for the videos to actually um, uh, be watchable. Uh, and I think in uh, um, organizations like the uh, schemes like the Medea Awards uh, for recognizing video production, especially user produced videos, um, those are some of the things that are taken into account. Um, I think many, and that's the experience I have here with, um, with a lot of academics in higher education, um, they find it hard to imagine how to design an assessment activity around the use of video um, projects for students um, over and above those students who are on media studies courses. Um, and I think that's something that uh, um, we need to start looking at further. Obviously, there are technical um, issues there. Um, do our MOOC platforms support huge numbers um, of, uh, uh, of videos produced by learners? Uh, or are we going to suggest that they use uh, the general public sites like YouTube? And I see the time ticking on, so I'll stop. <laughs> Thank you very much, Deborah. Any final thoughts, Matty? The golden age of video? MOOCs make it all much easier? Um, I, I don't think it's MOOC that is as new or video as new in MOOCs. I think that MOOCs, first of all, are, are enabled by the fact that video was becoming such an, uh, a common instrument. To be honest, the first MOOCs were just videos uh, of, of lectures and that was it. Uh, but I think what's, what is really new is, is the fact that video is becoming so accessible for everybody, for both the user as the producer. And uh, the fact that now more and more people are, in, are just assuming that video should be there, but that there is not so much thought given about how to use the video then properly, in fact, uh, both from uh, the user side, the learner side, as the producer side. So people expect to see videos, but then uh, we, the, the producers cannot expect that uh, the, the users are using it in the way that, that, uh, that it's supposed to be working. So I think that is the big thing. We, we're at the, the, the top of the hype curve of using video in general much more, but I think the, the, the lessons learned still have to be picked up.
Thank you both very much. We're going to stop it there, as you can see. And thanks very much, Hadrika, as well. If you'd like to host a MOOC on Emma, please do contact us. Our new Emma MOOCs have just started. and uh, Roll in a MOOC today. It's very good for you. Spring is the time to be learning new things. And our next webinar in the series is taking place on the 3rd of May. And we're going to be talking about social media as a way to both enhance and promote your MOOC and also within the MOOC design itself, how to use it in terms of engaging with your learners, different types of social media. And the two speakers the next time around will be Eleonora Panto from CSP Innesley and myself. So looking forward to seeing you soon. The recording of this webinar will be available shortly on the Emma website along with the slides. Deborah and Matty, thank you both very much. Bye bye now. Thank you all. Thank you for hosting Sally. Bye bye. Bye bye.